Hey everybody, this is AHA Computing. In a nutshell, I'm your guide, Alex Nugent, in an attempt to make this accessible for everybody. Today I will be explaining why AHA Computing is efficient. In a previous episode, we compared biology to traditional computing as cars and demonstrated uh, that if you gave each sort of equivalent amount of gas, biology would go around the planet and traditional computing would make it about an inch. And this is rather surprising. Uh, now this is for the types of things that biology is good at, namely brains, pattern recognition, perception, brain-like stuff. Uh, but nonetheless, this is a very big discrepancy, and this is the discrepancy that AHA Computing is trying to narrow and ultimately, hopefully, eliminate. So let's let's understand this, and that's what this uh, this episode is about. But first, we need to point something out, which is really quite interesting. Our communication technology is faster than biology, and it's not just like a little bit faster; it's like way faster. Okay, so the signals in our brain uh, propagate along these, uh, these things called axons, um, and they have this, uh, this depolarization that occurs as this voltage sort of wave moves along this, uh, this axon. And it's this sort of complicated process, um, ion channels opening and closing and whatnot. Um, it's, it's from a communication perspective, it's really kind of kludgy. And in one second, um, it'll travel about 100 meters, which is about a football field. Well, you know, modern um, microelectronics moving towards silicon photonics, that's, that's you know, waveguides, light on chips, and even, you know, electric fields on chips travel at nine-tenths the speed of light. So in that one second, you know, these signals can travel around the world seven times. Um, <laughs> so it's not just like a little faster, it's like way faster. Okay, so this is, this is the first observation. Uh, the second observation is that our current microfabrication technology is, and has been for a while, considerably smaller than uh, biology um, in, in the 2D plane. Uh, you know, when you compare it to neurons and, and synapses, it's, it's kind of crazy, right? Like a neuron body is, is uh, like 4,000 to 100,000 nanometers across, and a synapse is about 500 nanometers. Viruses? Uh, 400 to 40 nanometers, and a commercial transistor, this is stepping back a few nodes, this isn't even the uh, most advanced commercially deployed transistors, we're talking 28 nanometer. Uh, that's like half the size of some of the smallest viruses. <laughs> so you got to be asking yourself, wait a minute, if our existing commun communication technology is faster and our existing microfabrication technology is smaller than why is our computing technology so inefficient? And again, the, the conditional here is, is for brain-like things. Perception, planning, control, inference, prediction, you know, all, all of the things that we're interested in right now. Learning. Well, right, the numbers don't seem to add up. Um, we gotta we gotta understand this at sort of a, a deeper level, and that's what I'm, I want to communicate to you today. So you understand what it is that we're currently doing, uh, and how we can change what we do in order to reach the levels of efficiency uh, that we see in biology. So, how much energy does it take to add everything up? Okay, this is this is a good example. Um, this sort of drives at the heart of. Uh, neural networks and synapses and things like that. Um, and in a future episode, you will you'll see how this relates to something we call thermodynamic RAM. Uh, but nonetheless, let's use this as a uh, as a framework for understanding the difference between digital and uh, aha computing um, analog uh, methods of performing this operation. Okay, so imagine you have uh, this grid of cells, and each cell stores a number. Uh, which ranges between, let's say, 0 and 255, right? So that's 8 bits of information. So how much energy does it take to add up? Well, before I explain that, I want to explain uh, really a major contributor to power dissipation in, in microelectronics. Um, I'm going to give you an analogy to, to water. Okay, and imagine you have this trough. And on one side of the trough, you have, you have a hose. And on the other side, you have some detector, this little red thing right here. And 
you pour water into the trough, at first it's empty, and it fills up, and when it hits that detector, it goes bang. Okay. Now, imagine if you made this trough longer. Okay, so it had the same width to depth, but you just you just made it longer, and you did the same thing. What you'd find is that it would take longer to fill the trough. Okay. Before that detector hit, it takes longer because you're pouring the same amount of water in on one end, but because the trough is longer, it holds more water. Um, it has a higher capacity. Okay, well, this is an uh, analogy to electronics. Uh, it's very, very similar. Um, and so the energy that it takes to communicate over a wire, in this case, this trough is analogous to a wire, is equal to the total capacitance of the wire times the voltage squared divided by two. Okay, this is a very standard equation in physics. All right, so the, the analogy here is that electrons are like water and the trough is like a wire. Now, the longer the trough, the more water um, that it will hold, the longer the wire, the more electrons that it holds. So the capacitance is a linear function of the distance. Okay. So if we want to ask how much energy it takes to add everything up, well, uh, this equation gives us a good starting point for answering that question. Uh, so if the capacitance is a linear function of the distance, uh, then the total energy that it takes to add all these numbers up, um, at least a big component of it, will be related to shuttling all this information back and forth. Okay, so the total energy would be equal to the total communication distance times the voltage squared. Okay, so summing it up, the energy to add up the numbers is proportional to the total communication distance required in indexing and retrieving them multiplied by the voltage squared. So what we have to do is get an understanding of what's, what's involved in indexing and retrieving uh, all of these numbers. And then we're going to add up the total communication distance and get a sort of visual representation of how much total energy has been consumed. Okay, so let's start. Uh, this is uh, sort of an idealization of um, how we uh, use memory today in digital electronics. Okay, so we have this 2D grid of cells and we want to index them. Okay, so the way that we do that is that we have what's called row and column decoders. Um, and each one of these row and column decoders takes some number of bits from our, our uh, indexing register, we call it. Okay, since there's 64 uh, cells here, we need 6 bits in order to index them. Okay, 2, 4, uh, 8, 16, 32, 64. Okay, so half of the bits go to the row decoder, half of the bits go to the column decoder. And every row and every column uh, has some little circuitry in it that looks at those wires and, and uh, fires if, if the wires, um, the, the state on the wires matches with its particular row or its particular column. So in this case, we see we charge these wires and this row uh, was activated and this column was activated. Okay, now this inside the cell, there's more circuitry in there that says, ah, both my row and column have been activated. Therefore, I know that um, there's a system that is requesting the information that I'm storing in my cell. Okay, so I have to now, as the cell, communicate this back to the requesting process. Well, we had eight bits, um, which holds zero to 255. Uh, discrete levels. Uh, so we have to charge eight wires to communicate those eight bits. And we have to get those wires, uh, those bits, um, communicated from the cell to the place that is requesting them. In this case, a little circuit that's adding things up. Okay, so um, in order to do that, this is just sort of imagine we've, we've put this circuit here. Um, you could imagine putting it in a lot of places, even underneath this thing in, in, uh, in three dimensions. Uh, but in any case, imagine what sort of the average distance is going to be um, between the cells and the place that's requesting them. Um, in this case, we're going to say this is about um, this is about the average distance. Okay. So we indexed a cell, we retrieved the values, and in the process, we had to charge up this many wires. Okay. Now we have to index another cell, and we have to retrieve it, and in the process, we charge that many wires, so we've added um, some more wires to a running sum, and so on and so forth. Okay, so we keep on doing this, and we have, you know, an 8 by 8 grid, so in order to, the total energy uh, required to um, retrieve 
all of the, the bits for say one, one row or one column is, is this amount. And now we have eight rows or columns, so we have to add all of these up. Okay, so right here we have the total amount of wires, total communication distance that had to be, um, uh, that was required in order to retrieve all of these numbers from this grid of uh, cells. Now, I searched the internet and, um, for a, an expression that conveyed how I feel about this. <laughs> and uh, uh, this sort of captures it, which is sort of like, really? Are you kidding me? Um, no, I'm not kidding you. This is, this is how it's done. Uh, it, it, and it's done like this for good reason, but that reason doesn't have anything to do with efficiency. Okay, so the question is, is there another way to do this? And the answer is yes, there actually is another way. So this is what we're going to discuss. Okay, so imagine uh, you have a water pipe under some pressure. Um, you'll notice that I'm using this, this water analogy. Um, it's, it's a good analogy for electronics. Okay, so this, this water pipe under pressure is like a wire and we drill some holes into that, into that pipe. And we have some big holes and we have some little holes. And uh, underneath those holes, we, we have a funnel and uh, you know, the water flows out of the holes. The bigger the hole, the more water flows. And uh, under the funnel, we have a little beaker. Okay? And we collect all of the water. Okay, so this system is uh, analogous to, say, a circuit like this, where you have some, some voltage potential, which is being put across uh, all of these resistors or conductors, and they all have various sizes. And uh, what you do is you just measure the sum total current that is uh, coming out of all of these, uh, these resistors. Well, I mean, this is just nature. This is how it works. You get, the, you get the sum because currents naturally sum. If you have one electron and another electron, you have two electrons. Current sum. If you have you know, one branch of a river, river tributary and you have another branch and they come together to form another river, the, the total flow out of that combined river is the sum of the two rivers, right? This is, this is how nature works. Currents sum. Okay, so we don't have to compute uh, the sum, which we did in, in our previous example. We get it for free. Uh, and, and we've reduced the uh, the values of these numbers to you know specific resistances. Well, it doesn't really make a whole lot of sense to have um, you know some chip that has all these hard wired resistances in it. What we need is the ability to vary the resistance, and that's where this new device uh, called a memristor comes in. It allows you to set various resistance levels. So you can imagine um, you know all of these numbers uh, in this in these cells could be represented by memristors. And uh, they're all initialized into various states. Okay, so now what we have to do is drive a voltage across all of them at the same time and measure the combined current. Okay, so in place of this digital adder circuit that's having to index and retrieve these digital bits, we have this controller. And what it does is it charges um, a wire, and that wire splits up and splits up until it gets to all the cells. And uh, it has another wire, which connects to the other end of these memristors, one memristor, say, per, per cell. And uh, just like I showed you before, um, it just measures the combined current um, from all of these different memristors. And that current is proportional to the, the sum of the, the, the conductances. Okay, so how much energy does this take in order to add everything up? Well, in order to measure the combined current, we had to charge all of these wires. Okay, so we're gonna do the same thing. We're gonna look at the total amount of wires that had to be charged in order to communicate the, in order to, you know, in this case, um, charge the memristors in order to put a, a voltage across it and in order to convert that to a current and then to gather all the current up. Okay, so we still had to charge all of these wires and this is, this is what we had to charge. Okay, so let's add all of these up. Okay, this is the sum total wires that had to be charged. So when you compare to the, you know digital, uh, it's not bad, right? I mean, you're you're looking at um, something that's not only faster because you know this all happened at once, um, but also you know a great deal more efficient. Much less wires had to be charged in order to extract um, a value that is representative of the sum over all of these these elements. So you know memristors 
can radically reduce the total communication distance for some problems. Okay? Not, not everything. Uh, digital computing is, is uh, flipping amazing for many things. Uh, but for some problems, um, like what I just showed you, uh, there's other ways to do it, especially if you have tolerance for things like noise within the underlying, say, algorithms that you're trying to implement. Uh, so this is this is pretty good. Um, this isn't, you know, a factor of a million or anything, but this is this is getting good. But remember, the you know the energy um, was proportional to you know the capacitance and the voltage squared, and since it goes as the voltage squared. If you reduce the voltage, you make you know you have a big impact on on the total amount of energy that's dissipated. So you know modern computers today operate at you know a little over a volt. Um, some of them some of them less than this, some of them more. In modern uh, not modern biology, our brains, uh, the neurons in our brains, um, typically a cortical uh, neuron, operates at 65 millivolts. Uh, this is a factor of about 18 lower than uh, modern computers. And so this, this is a really big source of uh, savings in, in power dissipation because, you know, the total energy over power that's dissipated um, is a function of, you know, the voltage squared. So if you reduce something, you know, by 18 times in voltage, the total reduction in energy is, you know, hundreds. Of times, so you go from you know something like like this, which seems good, to you know, <laughs> wow, this is this is starting to get you know very compelling. Why, you know, why aren't we doing this? This is like really, um, this is a really big, uh, really big source of energy dissipation. Why don't why don't we just lower the voltage? Because if we did, we'd go from you know something like this which is what we get when we just sort of change our architecture and, and we go to, you know, utilizing some analog properties of devices like memristors. And then if we reduce the voltage down to, you know, the scale of biology or not even that far, uh, we'd end up with something like this. Okay, this is a big difference in the amount of energy that is required in order to perform this, this operation. Uh, now, I, again, searched the internet for an expression. <laughs> <laughs> that one might have upon hearing this information, and Bill Murray captures it quite well, which is like, um, okay, but, you know, why, hey, why are we doing this, right? That sounds great, Alex, but uh, what's the catch, right? Um, you know, engineers aren't stupid. Uh, why don't we just lower the voltage on, on all of our chips and just reap the benefits of this amazing savings? Well, it's really uh, not so simple, and the reason for that is something that we call the adaptive power problem, and that is the subject of the next lecture.